Meeting of the Board of Education on March 26, 2019. Could we please stand for invocation by Mr. Renier? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, on the light side, um, tonight's Board Appreciation Night, and uh, I think the biggest takeaway that I have, this is about my third one, and uh, my biggest takeaway is there's nine of us that sit up here, and we'll talk about things, we'll pass policies, we'll talk about things. But the work in the heart of this school system, and the reason that we're up here is because of people who sit on that side of the table, because of everyone who's on that side of the table, and everyone in the hallway and at their homes right now. Um, we get gifts, and, and I'm grateful for everything that I get here. Um, but the work that's being done in our school systems um, is because of the families that are in this town, because of the professionals that are in this town. Uh, and it makes the nine of us a lot easier to do what we have to do because of the strong support system we have in our town. Um, and I'd just like to take a minute and reflect on how great we are in this town of Enfield, sticking together as a family through the thick and thin to make sure that we do the best for our kids every day. So I just want to take a moment. And I will pledge your allegiance to our flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. God bless America. Thank you, Mr. Renier, and I like to second that, and it's very nicely said. Fire evacuation notice. We have two exits out of the chambers, one behind you all to the rear of the chambers, out, go out to the, to, uh, to the parking lot or my left, your right, and a left down the stairs and to the rear parking lot. Could we have roll call, please? Mr. Renier? Here. Mrs. DePoe? Here. Mr. Rutledge? Here. Mrs. Riley? Mrs. LeBlanc? Here. Mrs. Hernandez? Mr. Neville? Here. Mr. Ryder? Chairman Cruzel? Here. Ms. Riley is homesick. Mr. Ryder is still recuperating from his surgery, and Ms. Hernandez had a, another event today. Uh, board guests, Mr. Mr. Dresden. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. As you can tell, we have a lot of special guests this evening. Um, first, as Mr. Renier mentioned in his invocation, that this month is actually Board Appreciation Month. So as you can see up at your seats, you have some very special gifts out from our schools. I do have to say a caveat that there was other gifts that were um, intending to be delivered this evening, but there was a hiccup. So you're going to get Board Appreciation Months plural um, and the, they'll they'll be at the next regularly scheduled board meeting to so you it's like Christmas in July for you guys um, but we do have some extremely special guests as you can tell by the audience today and I'll apologize to our, our Enfield delegation you're gonna have to this will be a good reminder of why you guys are in Hartford because you're gonna need to sit through all this so that's why we put you last um, but at this time I'm actually gonna ask uh, Ms. Jacqueline Valley who is our co coordinator of our pre-k steam program to come introduce a little video vignette that they put together for you and I don't and I know there's a lot of people here so if you want to bring anyone else Jacqueline it's going to be her fault if she called you up there I see Karen there I don't want to put you on the spot but Karen and Jen, and Jen. You, can, you, can, you can grab the you can grab the wireless mic there on the end and just turn this turn the switch on and away it goes Better? There we go. Okay, so first of all, we want to thank you. Um, we are partners in Stowe Early Learning Center, and as a thank you to you, um, we brought some tiny friends with us to share part of our collaborative art project that's been going on, and we want to give a special thank you to Walter and Charlotte because they actually drilled holes in some bottle caps for us, and Jen's going to explain the project a little further. Not some bottle caps, thousands of bottle caps. So uh, at Stowe, all of the um, programs at Stowe have been working on a collaborative project in the Play Lab, and we sent you, we gave you a little flyer about it. But um, we've been, you want to, you want to show what, show what you guys have been making? Can you hold it up? Can you hold it up? So we have been stringing um, bottle caps and beads to make patterns and all sorts of really nifty things. And we are going to once we get a little bit further and the weather right turns it bit nicer we are going to put them outside um, in our courtyards and in the building so that to decorate our building so this kind of um, 
play uh, also gives kids an opportunity to practice their fine motor skills, their executive function skills, hand-eye coordination, um, and a number of other academic and life skills, as well Thank as um, giving them an opportunity to do some upcycling. You. Turn around. Look at yourselves on TV. You want to see yourself on TV? <laughs> that is okay. I was done anyway. They're, they've got better people to look at, which is cool. And it's, and it's all on the flyer. They can read it at their leisure. Yeah, that's fine. That happens. <laughs> Are you up next with the video? I'm not. Yeah, okay. So I think that was it for us and for our, our presentation. This is just something fun that we're doing at Stowe. And um, next time you're out in the building, maybe you'll be able to see some of them decorating the building. I want to personally thank all of you for coming out. And I'm glad my holes meant something. Uh. So I take it we got a little video, Mr. Guy? Yes. When Mr. Mr. Barassa is setting up the video for you, it's all, all the schools that asked if they were, were interested in having them come tonight to present. Um, but as Ms. Valley puts it, I want to bring the tiny humans for the board to see. So we asked all the other schools, they got a year reprieve from doing this, and we're, we're going to focus our cooperative effort, not just between our kids at, in the STEAM program, but all of our kids uh, that are over at Stowe with ECDC and obviously with a great partner in Kite. Tried to fill in the time the best I could and hoping Guy would hit play. <laughs> I don't know if we have to show a little circle and a technical difficulties. Please stand by. Hopefully not this time. <coughs> so what are you thinking of weather, people? <laughs> Isn't it cold out there? Downright bomb during the day. No more snow days? Shh. Oh, boy. <laughs> oh, there you go, Rich. Now you just Maybe put the mic down. Maybe it's coming in through the system, so they have to turn it up from. I love school. There we go. <laughs> Yeah. 
care. it up on the website and put it out on social media and that so thank you to our little humans thank you very much this is why we're up here this is why we do what we do and we thank you all for for coming to our meeting and and our little gifts it will hang in my office thank you <laughs> One more round of applause for him. Good night. Enjoy it because they do get old. Yeah. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. All right, Mr. Dresick, I guess we should. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Our next guest is all of our winner athletes. So for our winner student athletic recognition, I'm going to ask Mr. Corey O'Connor, our athletic director, to come up. Hello. Uh, once again, a fine season has come to the end at uh, Enfield High School. Um, before we get to the individual teams, I would like to uh, put together some news. Um, one of the things we've been focused on is obviously being a student athlete, working on our academics. Um, and this past season, I um, want to congratulate 
the student athletes and the coaches for working so hard that 99.5% uh, of our students maintain their acad academic eligibility um, with 42% of those student athletes um, receiving honors or high honors. Um, so obviously our goal is 100% on both of them, um, but we will continue to strive to work hard to get to that goal. Um, also, uh, when you enter Enfield High School gym, you will see a, a next level board. Um, in the past, it recognizes all the student athletes that move on to uh, the college level to participate. Um, we already have um, signing days for our Division I and II athletes. Um, what you will hear is um, an announcement for a what we're going to call the next level ceremony. Uh, this will honor all divisions, Division I, II, Junior College, Division III. Um, they will all receive their They will all receive their next level board, has their name, sport, and where they're going. Um, we'll invite the public to come down, and they will, the student athletes themselves will enter this into the next level board. Um, so you'll hear about that. That'll be um, near the end of May. Um, and one last thing um, for an overall, um, on May 22nd, um, if anybody wants to head down to Dunkin' Donuts Park, our baseball team uh, will be playing East Granby at 3.30 at Dunkin' Donuts Park. Um, so look, forward, uh, look for more announcements about that. Um, and now we can get on to the individual teams. Um, first, um, we'll have Coach Maggie Sayers uh, for the JFK girls basketball team. Hello, my name is Maggie Sayers. I am losing my voice a little bit, so I will do my best. Um, these are also two of my student athletes, Alyssa Rosignol, who is an eighth grader, and Mia Daly, who is a seventh grader. This year was my first year coaching uh, basketball at JFK. It's also my first year teaching there. Um, we went 10 and two in the regular season. Both of our regular season losses were um, by less than 10 points as well um, into the same school. Uh, we went to the playoffs. Our first round was at uh, JFK, and we beat Timothy Edwards um, handily enough. And we had our championship game at Illing Middle School in Manchester, where we won 41 to 40, which was a very close and <coughs> agonizing last minute of the game for me and them, I'm sure, as well. And we were able to take home this trophy for the first time in a very long time. So it was a credit to my athletes because they are a very talented and hardworking group of ladies. <coughs> um, not only are they like awesome on the court, but they're very, very caring, compassionate, and wonderful kids around school. I was super lucky as my first year as a coach to have not only great athletes, but great students. And right from the first day, they were super welcoming and easy to work with. So we had a really wonderful season, and hopefully I look forward to a few more great seasons with them. Good job, ladies. Thank you. Up next, uh, Jacqueline Jeffers and cheerleading. Hi, I'm Tasha, and this is Jackie. Hi. And we are the new cheerleading coaches. Um, we are near. Okay, good. Oh, no, oh, great, thanks. <laughs> um, so we are new to the high school program, but we are not new to cheerleading coaching. We've coached together um, for many years in different capacities. This year brought um, new challenges and new rewards. Um, first, really think. We're very thankful to Corey. He's been a great support, and he's so invested in the success of our program, so thank you. It's really nice to have that um, in our corner. Um, but we are so proud of how far we came in one season and how far we look to go. Um, we definitely are looking to build this program, and we think that we really came very far in one season, and, and the team was so committed to improving, and we really, um, I think, did very well for for our first season, and we placed third, and we traveled all over the state, and, and I think that we have only up to go from here, and I'm very proud of how far we came. So we look forward to more seasons and more success. Thank you. Thank you. 
Uh, up next, we'll have uh, Ice Hockey and Frank Genovese. Thank you all for having us tonight. In terms of wins and losses, uh, this year did not match last year, unfortunately. <clears throat> It was very difficult, though, to place, replace the five players we lost to graduation. But the kids always came to play. Our kids came every day. They practiced hard right till the end. Um, one of the things the coaches do talk about is uh, the ability to get better every day, uh, whether you're on the ice uh, or in the classroom. And we say, just do something better every day. And the kids took that approach. So even though the record didn't say so, um, they came They came to work every day. <clears throat> we did have a couple of nice individual accomplishments. Um, Patrick Fleming, who was our leading scorer, a, a senior at Enfield High, um, he did get recognized by the state. He was named Division III First Team All-State. Um, Patrick also received all-conference honors for his play. Um, in addition to that, Zach Hasha uh, from East Granby High School also received all-conference honors. Uh, those same two players also played uh, this past weekend in the senior all-star game, uh, while junior Clay Coey from Enfield High School played in the junior all-star game. Um, and lastly, I just would like to recognize the five seniors that will be graduating and, and thank them for their hard work and dedication to the program. Uh, aforementioned uh, Patrick Fleming and Zach Hasha, also Patrick McGlynn, Tyler Nadu, and Troy Adams. Again, thank you for having us tonight. Up next, we'll go wrestling and Andrew DePere. Uh, we had a uh, tremendous year this year with Enfield Wrestling. This is my first year as the head coach. And um, we had a great season, not only on the map, but also in the classroom, um, which I am most proud of. We had 100% uh, of our team was academically eligible this year, as well as six wrestlers made all-conference academic teams. So that, that was a highlight of the, the season in the classroom. Uh, on the mat, we shined as well. We had, uh, we went, had a record of 14 and nine. 14 wins was the most wins that a Fermi Enfield team has had since 2007. Uh, we competed in tournaments throughout the year. We placed second in a tournament in Avon, which was the first time a Enfield or Fermi team has placed in a team tournament. And we also took first place in a individual wrestling tournament. And that's the first time a team from Enfield has won an individual tournament since 2000. Um, and also, we received some uh, votes for the top 10 and received honorable mention uh, recognition. And that's the first time a team since 1999. And that Rich Rennie was on that team as well. Um, we had nine wrestlers who were all conference. And we had one wrestler who placed in the state tournament and went on to compete in the state open tournament. Which, and he fell one match short of placing the state open tournament, which would have brought him on to wrestle in the New England championships. Um, wanted to have some guys with us tonight, but unfortunately, it was the first night of off-season wrestling for them. So we had seven guys who, who are continuing to wrestle throughout the spring and summer. Uh, we have a lot of good things to come next year. We have 17 guys returning. So can't wait to be back next year with uh, some more great news. Thank you. Up next, we'll go girls basketball and Jay Goucher. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for having us. Um, with me today is Cassie Urso. And Cassie was one of our seniors this year and brought her. Um, I have her in class. But the reason I brought her was not just because I have her in class, but because of who she is and what she um, resembles and what she does and and to me she's a true leader of our program and she is what we think about when we think of Eagles basketball. So Cassie this year along with her commitment to work in at Sunny's Place and with playing basketball practices 2.30 to 5, she found time to volunteer and coach a travel basketball team. Um, so that was on top two nights a week, weekends. She also helped our team organize. We did a lot of stuff in the community along with wrestling and boys basketball. We did a fundraiser for pediatric cancer called Go For The Goal. We raised over $2,000 for that. Um, she helped organize our girls to get help out with, we did a summer camp and with kids clinics. Um, we helped out this year with loaves and fishes and she was one of the leaders that helped organize and made sure all our girls were in order. Because of that, she was recognized by the school and she won the ShopRite Kindness Award. So, bravo her. 
Unfortunately, she's a senior. She's leaving us, and she's going to be going to play basketball at Huston University up in Maine. So she's got her snow boots ready to go. Um, as a program this year, it was a little bit of a rebuilding year. We graduated uh, some tremendous young ladies. Uh, we had a lot of tremendous young ladies in our program this year. Unfortunately, our record did not match our efforts. We, uh, this year, we won two games. We lost 10 games by five points or less um, as a program. Uh, Caitlin Bork made the Rotary Tournament team in our holiday tournament. And um, the leadership that Cassie and KB showed, um, our younger girls next year hope to go, come back to the levels we were before. Thank you for having us. Up next, we'll go indoor track and Mike Terletto. Thank you for having us. So I'm Mike Terletto, the head indoor coach this season. This is Coach Amy Bartholomew. Uh, with us tonight, we brought some athletes. We have Sierra Johnson, Matt Bork, Kyle DeShane, Eric Maloney, Sean Selesky. They all qualified for the state meet, along with 14 other athletes. So just congratulations to them. So I want to recognize and thank each individual athlete for their commitment. We had over 51 athletes competing this season. So uh, almost every athlete on the team set a personal record in at least one event. Uh, we were able to bring, like I said, almost 20 student athletes to the double L qualifying state meet. And one athlete, Joel Stewart, advanced to the state open meet and earned all conference. Thank you. Uh, I want to thank Coach B. She's awesome. She did an amazing job this season. Uh, she scheduled buses, submitted qualifying time. She is just always a positive person. Uh, she deserves a lot of the credit for our success, and she de deserves the board's highest praise. I think what, what is most impressive is what our team was able to do off the track. Uh, as a team, we raised over 350 pounds for the Enfield Food Shelf. Uh, after the first week of the season, we had about 10 students on the probation list. And by the end of the season, 35 students uh, made the honor roll. Uh, 20, 25 of those students were on the high honor roll. So we had more students on the high honor roll than the honor roll. So uh, it was a major, major success. Lastly, I want to thank our athletic director, Corey O'Connell. Uh, his support and guidance, he's awesome. He does such a good job. He's always there for the coaches and for the athletes. So. Uh, thank you, board, for having us. Appreciate it. And we'll go boys basketball and coach Kevin Zalke. All right. Thank you guys for having us here tonight. Thank you, board. Thank you, athletic director O'Connell. Uh, he did a really good job in leading us coaches <clears throat> and leading our team. Uh, and coaches to the right way that we teach our athletes every single day. Um, to my left, I have Coach James, a phenomenal role model for the community, and my right-hand man. Uh, as a leader and as a coach, you really need good people by your side to help you run the program the right way. I couldn't find a better assistant coach than Mike James right here. Um, I'll get to some more about Coach James in a little bit, but we'll st first talk about the number of um, players that achieved honor roll status for us this year. There were 14 players out of the 29 that were kept in the team that made honor roll, so just shy under 50%, which is an amazing accomplishment for them. Um, I have to thank my wife and Verizon Wireless for the amount of time I'm spent on the phone. There's a lot for coaches in here that go into breaking games down, breaking practices down, that go well beyond the expected hours of work. Uh, so thank you to my man here. He's a real good uh, person to listen to, and thank you for my wife because she was very generous with uh, turning her head during the basketball season. Um, in terms of leadership within the, the town and in the program, um, we had a really good system player who was Kyle Maneker. He can't be here tonight. He was, um, he was named all-conference this year, which was a great accomplishment, but that is just the, the tip of the iceberg for how awesome a person Kyle is. So to my left, Coach James says, how can we get um, some blood with our program into the, the younger levels? Um, Kyle Maneker and Cody McGinnis, a sophomore, took on the leadership role of coaching a fifth grade boys basketball team for the travel team in town. Uh, they led, under their direction, led those kids to the championship in fifth grade. They lost to Stafford, unfortunately. Um, but they went out fighting. They fought really hard. It was awesome to watch them. And 
talked to Kyle and Cody about what it takes to be a coach outside of uh, outside of the the court where they're as players. Um, coach James, in addition to working in the school system in Stafford, comes. He coaches. We have the late time slot. We usually don't get out of practice until 7:30. Um, he left and went and donated his time to coach the sixth grade travel team along. Um, coach Goucher and Cassie talked a little bit about it. Coach James brought home a championship with uh, his boys at the sixth grade level. So there are some really, really good young pieces coming up that we can't wait to coach in high school. Um, along the same lines with Kyle Menneker, who was one of our coaches, he was selected uh, as the preseason current Fab 15. Uh, in the greater Hartford area, they do a really good job of covering local sports. And they chose the 15 best players, um, no grade level aside. And he was mentioned with them in the preseason. So the preseason is great, but we all talk about how we finish. So Kyle also was selected two times throughout that season. They, um, each week, they highlight the top 15 performers within the uh, greater Hartford area. He was selected twice and then finished the season also on, on that as well. In addition to community service that the, the team took part in, uh, we ran a coaching or a kind of basketball players clinic for the fifth to eighth graders. Uh, we did it over at the Enfield Annex with the partnership of the Enfield Travel Director and the girls and boys basketball coaches and players. So it was really cool to see them give back and kind of teach some of the things that we do and teach our kids day to day throughout and uh, watch them give back. Um, missing anything? Yeah, uh, very, very fortunate to have the staff that we had with us and the players that worked really hard. Um, we couldn't do it without them. So thank you guys, thank you board. And a new program that was reinstated this year uh, was our boys swimming program. Uh, Coach Rubin could not be here tonight, um, but we look for some positive things moving up in the future with them. So I thank everyone, thank the coaches, thank the student athletes, thank you board for your support, and go Eagles. One more round of applause for you. <laughs> Ms. LeBlanc would like to say something. I'm just gonna say something while you are all here. Um, being a, a mother of, um, athletes at Enfield High. Um, I've seen a tremendous growth in this program since the schools merged in 2016-2017. Um, I think what the school is embracing is a lot of Eagle pride. Um, what's even more wonderful is the emphasis that's being put on the academics for the athletes. Um, I think it's tremendous that you guys can come here and tell us um, the student athletes that are on the honor roll or just maintained what they needed to maintain because a lot of times um, we all know that's that sports is what, <laughs> what motivates some kids and it, and it helps them to go to practice every day and to have good role models in the coaching and, and, and other teammates. Um, I think what's important is that we are seeing these older kids bridge to the younger kids. Uh, football did trick or trunk with the Enfield Ramblers where they did a little trick or treat street in the Fermi parking lot, decorated their cars um, and the Ramblers and the flag football players came up and, and trick or treated. Um, the Enfield High basketball team for a few years now is running clinics and summer camps, um, both the boys and the girls. Uh, for the younger basketball players. Um, baseball just had their players uh, help out with the Enfield Little League evaluations. To me, that's um, not only great for the younger kids, but it's also great for the older kids because it's, it's about a sense of community and we're one high school now and we wanna be out in the community. Um, I, I'll, I'll say this and I don't wanna embarrass them, but I saw the cheerleading coaches out um, and I commended them on, on what they've done with the cheerleading program um, that has had tremendous growth. Um, it's amazing uh, what you guys have done in a short time. I was impressed um, during football season and then I hadn't seen them until basketball season and it, wow, they had come a long way. Um, so I think what's important is that um, not only are you a proud student at Enfield High, if you are, whether you're in like your drama club or um, you're involved in other clubs or you're an athlete, there's definitely a feeling of Eagle pride and that comes under the direction of the teachers and the administrators and our athletic director. So I thank you all. I thank all the student athletes that are here. I know it's not always easy, um, but thank you again and thank you for representing Enfield well. Anyone else, anyone else want to speak? So I have two things. It's, it's in our motto. We make a difference in Enfield, every child, every day. And this proves it right here. I mean, it's just amazing. And to the wrestling coach, if you need Rich, I, <laughs> I heard he's got one more year of eligibility left. And all I got to do is call a motion up here. And we'll get him back for you. So <laughs> again, thank you all for coming out. Thank you for what you do. Mr. O'Connell, thank you for what you do. It's it's. It's just great to see. So one more round of applause, please.
And you are all excused yes, if you, you don't wish. Have to stay. <laughs> <laughs> Any word on Tom? Yeah, Tom he, he said seven. He talked to him. He said seven thirty will be done. All right, Mr. Dresick. Okay, last but not least, our Enfield legislative delegation. So I'd like to welcome Senator Kissel, Representative Hall, Representative Arnone, and is. I can't promise you what they're going to ask you about, but my job here is done. We got you here. One thing I know, we can clear a room. <laughs> Senator Kissel, Mr. Representative Arnone, Representative Hall, thank you for coming. I know you guys are very busy this time of year, and we thank you for giving us a few minutes. So we will let you begin. Any presentation or any sure. good news or bad news? Just, start. Uh, just support, talk right? it on the microphone. Uh, Either one. Microphone. Either one. Just turn it. Yeah. Well, if I turn this on. You turn that on, and there you go. There we go. One, two, one, two. No, it's a trick microphone. Where you got hold of? Hello. Hello. There, oh, there we, we go. go. Uh, Mr. Chair, members of the Board of Education, Mr. Superintendent, uh, other esteemed guests. Uh, tremendously honored to be here. You know, you stated during that last presentation that the little humans as well as the athletes are just part of the reason why you're up there. Well, let me tell you, that's part of the reason why I'm over here as well. Uh, it's just very uplifting. Hartford can be a tough place, uh, fighting for the things that you want to fight for and trying to stop things that you think are bad for the state. Uh, but to see this, this is just a fabulous community, so proud. Uh, to be here representing all you folks. Uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, I think I've told you this in the past. The folks that work to, to make this new high school a, a wonderful place just did a fabulous job. Uh, my son is a freshman there. Uh, there's ups and downs uh, as far as going into that school, but it's a beautiful facility, and I marvel bringing him in there every day, how I can like maneuver in and out, uh, and so many people uh, traveling in there. As far as some of the issues go, uh, uh, I'm sure that you'll have some questions, but I was happy to see that the JFK money is in the, the bill in the Education Committee, uh, right there, right behind Bridgeport, which has, like, they're looking for, I think, close to $100 million. So that's the kind of bill that we like to say has legs, because a lot of folks have an interest in making sure that that bill will pass. Uh, also, we received news today. It's not directly an education issue, but on the town side, they were looking to get some money on the bonding agenda for the sewage treatment plant. That is in the next bond committee agenda, so that'll uh, relieve some of the stress on the town side of the budget as they move forward with that project. Uh, and the last thing that I I'll state, uh, at this time, we did some research. That whole forced regionalization issue put forward by Senator Looney, the President of the Senate, uh, as of right now, is dead uh, because they had a public hearing, but they never moved to draft a specific bill. And that time has come and gone. Uh, I think there was a huge uh, hue and cry throughout the state of Connecticut. Hey, listen, uh, folks want to do things amongst themselves in a positive fashion, that's one thing, carrot approach, but the stick approach, the forced regionalization, that was a bad idea. I met with Superintendent and Board of Education in Granby, I met with the Superintendent uh, of the Board of Edu uh, Superintendent of Schools over in Summers. Uh, you know, everywhere in my district, all seven towns, they were not happy with that proposal. So I don't think we have to worry about it right now, and I'll just hand it over to Carol. Good evening, everybody, and thank you for the invitation to have us all before you. Um, it's always great to come back and visit, and uh, I'm actually glad we got to go last because I, I truly, and I said this to Tom last week, I, I actually miss seeing everybody and the kids especially. It's so much fun, and they were they were awesome. So thank you for making us go last. It was great. 
Um, so as many of you probably know already, I'm, I'm going to just go over the numbers um, only because I sit on appropriations again this year, um, which um, <laughs> much to my dismay. No, I actually, I actually love appropriations. Um, so basically, the good news for Enfield this year um, in ECS cost sharing, your numbers are up. Um, so for ECS, this this coming, so 2019's uh, increase is about $340,149. Um, for the next year in the biennium, you're going up to $696,213,000. Now, I want to preface this with the fact that this is the governor's budget right now that we're talking these numbers. Um, the numbers have not come out of appropriations yet, so appropriations has not come up with their budget yet. So that's the next step. Um, once that happens, uh, we can quantify the numbers for you a little bit better. Um, but right now, the numbers do look obviously much more favorable than they did last year at this time. Um, we have had assurances from the governor's office that the numbers, um, he has no intention of cutting um, mid-year. Um, like we experienced last budget, which was devastating. Um, so we have had um, preliminary uh, promises from the governor's office that that's not going to happen. So that's the good news. Um, I'll pass it over to Tom, and he might have other news. And just to give you a little bit of background, for me, and I, I don't know if John can go over his committees, this year mine are appropriations, public safety, and higher ed, which I'm ranking member on. Um, so I'm not on, um, on education anymore, which I actually uh, am going to miss. Um, so those are my committees this year. I can help uh, anything budget related. Um, if you have any questions as far as this coming budget when it gets in front of appropriations and we come down to our, our final numbers, just uh, reach out. And I, I will keep Chris informed as we go through the process. So thank you. I, too, thank you. Um, it was great seeing all the especially the community service that's being involved with uh, all the sports teams. That's ph phenomenal. So I'll, uh, I know we're, it's going to be a long night for you. A couple of things I just want to share with you. So as Carol said, uh, the funding is going up, and this is working, right? It'll hold it closer. And uh, so there's two grant formulas that are, they're using right now, and, and right now those numbers are from the, the governor's uh, formula. Now the, the regular formula we do a little better in, which is a current formula the state uses now, we do a little better in. Um, so those are still up in the air, which way the formulas are going to end up. But either way, it's a plus, uh, which is good. Um, and according to, uh, we're going to see increases in our ECS grant through fiscal 28 under the current uh, plan from the governor. So that's, that's also very good news. So uh, we're, we're just talking about the uh, regionalization. So now the word, uh, I'm on planning and development, uh, the word now is shared services. So we've had a couple of phenomenal meetings uh, from all different towns coming in discussing shared services. And I get to brag about Enfield. Uh, you are the leaders in shared services. You, sh you share uh, IT. You're sharing building and grounds. These are things that no other, uh, very few districts do. So we're fortunate we're, we're ahead of the, uh, of, the, of the curve on this. And when we get to um, uh, communications and dispatch, these are things the state would like to see regionalized in the area, which will also help this town actually gain income by hopefully taking in some of the smaller towns around us. So big applaud to all the years uh, we have worked together on the town side and the board side to share services. So I hear I see share services is a good thing. So that's something that, that uh, we need to do even more and show uh, the state that we are leaders in that. So thank you for that. Um, some of the other news just quickly. Um, so on the teachers' pensions, and you're going to probably ask us this. So uh, I, I made sure I did get some numbers. So uh, according to uh, OPM right now, it's, it's 46,000 for the first year 
and uh, it'll be 95,000 in FY21, uh, if it should pass. So uh, that is still a bill that uh, is floating around. Um, it's, it's not one of the more popular things on, on, uh, on this table here, uh, and that's uh, something that we'll have to now debate as we go through the process of, of, uh, of really bearing down on these. So I'll, I'll uh, go back to questions now. I think that's about everything I had. So one other quick thing, though, was Bill 6890, which was, uh, I believe you sent an uh, email out with the graduation um, yes. uh, requirements. So that just came out of uh, committee. Uh, but it's been rewritten, and now it's a—it's uh, actually a study. They've turned it into a study. So uh, this, is, yeah, I know. No, it's, <laughs> it was it too bad. So How many but, binders do we need? Yeah, and I still have my name on it now. <laughs> so I may, may be uh, moving that off of this bill. So I'll follow that through a little more to actually see what the changes were for the two, and I'll get that out to you because this just happened last night. Who wants to start, Mr. Neville? I'll pick up on Tom's question since I sent him a couple of notes about that. Uh, being a retired teacher, that pension really sticks in my craw yeah. uh, that, that, that it's even coming about. And if you haven't passed it yet, I'll give you ammunition so you can set the reason not to. Uh, I think you guys know I'm a man of my word. If I sign a contract, I'm going to keep it. We kept ours, okay? And I've been, I have 40 years of, of pay stubs that shows you where my part of the pension went, okay? I'd be happy to share it with anybody. I'd ask you to ask the state to show their stubs, too, because it doesn't exist. I resent that it's coming back to the towns. It doesn't belong at the town level that they should pay something that the state had guaranteed, just like we did, to pay. Okay, I'm not against paying pensions. I think, you know, that, that, that's an obligation on our part, but theirs as well. And uh, the part that I resent is the fact that it's coming back from where it should be. That wasn't, and I think people get the wrong idea. They're saying, you know, you're getting paid too much, you're, all this stuff. It, it, it's not, the, the system's not broken because we didn't pay. The system's broken because one side of the contract did not pay their share. For something like 30 years, I think, isn't it, Tom? Oh, more than 30. Since 1938, we have underfunded or not funded oh, at yeah. all yeah. the uh, uh, pensions in, in the in general. St uh, teachers uh, were a little, uh, were more like 30 years, but we've consistently. Uh, I think if we go, uh, you guys have passed the lockbox, or you've talked about those things. I, I think if you're going to do those kinds of things, you need to put it in a lockbox, just like we need transportation funds and so on. Go in there, so it can't be taken. Because, you know, I, I think it gives us, I, we cannot afford to have pensions that are out of whack, okay, pension funds. We can't. It's bad fiscally for the state, uh, and, and, and uh, I don't think that's who we are as a state. I think we're better than that. So I'll leave that one alone. Um, the other one is the tolls, okay? I'm in favor, not in favor of tolls. I mean, that, that's not my big issue. But my big issue is if, how much money do we get from the tolls? Because we're asking for that money. The governor's asking for that money because he sees it as filling a hole in the uh, in the budget and if he doesn't get tolls okay where is he going to go and this is my big issue last year they went to the, the most needy of our of our people in this state and took things out of some of the uh, hospitals and some of the services that were provided to some of our handicapped students and i i, I don't want to see that they can't speak up so i think we have to speak up for them so yeah, well, my position on tolls is pretty apparent. I mean, I'm totally opposed to tolls, and I think it would have a disparate negative impact, especially uh, here in north central Connecticut, because I-91 was never designed to be a no. toll road. So fundamentally, I mean, if you want to put tolls on 95, there's tolls along 95, what, from Florida all the way up to wherever it ends up in Maine. Uh, but 91, we've got Enfield, route, Enfield Street, Route 5, directly parallel to 91, right through our historic district, right in front of the high school entrance. Uh, we've got 75 on the other side of the river. And, you know, people in this town, my family, we will look at the paper, whether it's ShopRite, Stop and Shop, or Big Y, to save a buck here, a buck there, because people are making difficult choices. And so if people's choices, I'm going to hop off a of 91 in Enfield or never get on it, to go to work because, and my other job other than Hartford is down in Berlin, so why wouldn't I want to just hop onto one of those parallel roads and save five bucks? Maybe I have to hop onto 91 in Hartford, but people are going to do that. And my concern is, forget about the money for a second, it's like when there's a tractor trailer crash on 91, everybody pours off that highway and we see what it's like. And until they fix the crash, it's just bumper to bumper. Or if it's that big Saturday at the Big E, and people are just trying to get to the Big E, it jams up our local roads. Well, that's the way I'm concerned it's going to be all the time. 
The governor's looking for $800 million from Connecticut residents through tolls. And there will be an additional 40% of that from purportedly out-of-state drivers. So this is a tax increase or a fee or, you know, mileage tax, however you want to describe it. But it's $800 million from Connecticut taxpayers. There's a philosophical debate. Republicans believe and put forward a, a program called Prioritize Progress, which delineates priority projects as far as keeping the roads and bridges safe. The governor and his new transportation secretary, uh, d uh, com commissioner rather, and we're going to meet with them, uh, him uh, in the next couple of weeks regarding train station and other transportation issues. But, my, and I sit on transportation, it's like they want to do so many things fast, and I just don't think that we can afford that. So, and to Carol's point, I sit as ranking member on Judiciary Committee. I'm on the General Law Committee and the Transportation Committee. So I saw a lot of this. This whole tolls issue is percolating through the system. We will have a public forum. I encourage everybody here to come out to JFK Middle School. We were going to have it at the high school, but they were practicing for the spring play. So we didn't want to bump into that. Uh, and in fact, uh, Former Deputy Mayor Billy worked with our staff to try to make sure everything goes smoothly at JFK as far as parking and driving and hallways and everything. Uh, but that's an opportunity for folks to chime in. So it's not an easy issue by any stretch, but I just think the, the methodology, you know, tolls to me would be the very last thing. And not that I want them, but if you're going to have them, put them on roads like 84 or 95, where it's not going to have the dramatic negative impact on quality of life. That's just me. I don't want to hog it. No, I, I, I think, John, you, you said it best. I, I can't say anything John didn't uh, already speak about. So um, I just, again, I would encourage everybody to come out to the forum that's scheduled on the 16th. It will be an opportunity to actually ask questions as well. So it's not just a presentation. You'll be able to ask the ranking member and the senator that sits on transportation for very specific answers on any issues. So uh, on that. And then to Tim's uh, issue with the teacher pension, uh, I couldn't agree with you more. Um, I think that I, I can speak for myself. Um, and what we've heard from our caucus is they're totally against passing the teacher pension on to the towns. Um, we had the Teacher Retirement Board in front of appropriations last week, um, and uh, we had the presentation from the governor's office, but uh, we're totally, totally with you on this. We're, we're, we are not supporting shifting that burden onto the towns. Thank you. So I'm going to jump back on the tolls. So this is how I, I look at the toll issue right now, um, and it's a proposal. It's a proposal, and two of the three bills list the, the uh, actual highways on the bill that will be told. One bill asks for an authority. Um, that one set aside, the process allows for amendments. So now it's our job as we go to the floor, and we also lobby our own uh, legislators to make amendments to that. And those amendments, as John said, could end up with just 95 could end up with 15 and 95. It, we could totally lose the argument, and it could end up with all four. So everything is on the table. I've said it at the council meeting, and in my eyes, everything's on the table as we move through the process. I'll work, and we all will work, for what's best for Enfield and to try to get the best uh, deal for us through this as we possibly can. Because, again, we're, there's almost, with the Senate, there's close to 200 of us, and, and we're three. And hopefully our three will bring 30. Um, from people that we know and, and speak <coughs> with uh, in, in the uh, legislature itself. So hopefully the bill will get watered, washed, or washed out. So we'll see in the next couple of months. It's very hard to, to uh, uh, anticipate how we're going to go on this. So, and, and I do feel that this is a, um, it's just too much. Uh, there's no state that I've ever drove through that has every one of their major highways uh, uh, told. So, you know, that's now, like I said, it's our job to, to, to do what's necessary. Um, and and uh, uh, there are some necessary things that need to be done in, trans in transportation. I would just f finish by just urging you guys not to, to, just to be careful where they take cuts. If they're looking for money, they're going to take it from somewhere. Well, okay. And, and yes. if it's tolls, yeah. 
what, what you guys said, you know, 95 is told all the way up to Maine, so I pay it all the way up there. I just don't pay it in Connecticut, okay? And, uh, you know, I, the bridges, we pay all the way up there. It's all the way down the East Coast. So, I mean, I, that, I don't, that's, to me, that's the fairest way. The others are just logistically crazy, in, in my mind. Yeah. But, but I'm more concerned about if we don't get that, the question really is, we need money. If we don't take it out of that, what are we taking it from? And I'm just saying we need to be very, very careful. I, I didn't like what happened last year, and I think it was hitting the most needy of our population. So the tolls aren't figured in the overall um, budget. It's for transportation. Just? Uh, just for its transportation. So, that's, so whatever happens with this toll is going to happen to our infrastructure and how we're going to pay for it. So we're either going to do it, we're going to do it with the Republicans, uh, you know, want to go through bonding uh, and, and priorities, or we could go with some sort of, uh, uh, you know, way to fund this in the future. We, we have to look at it. We're trying to get a train station. We're trying to get ma mass transit going. And now that I'm traveling to Hartford again, <laughs> 91 isn't a funny place between 5 and 6 o'clock. Uh, and, and, you know, it's, it's frustrating. And, and then you sit in traffic and go, they're going to toll me for this? Uh, <laughs> so 91, I agree, was never told. And it's not told from, uh, from uh, Maine uh, uh, to uh, New Haven. So uh, those are the questions we have to go uh, through. And, and hopefully we'll resolve them and be happy when we come back. Can I just? Yes, please. I just want to add one thing and make it very clear. We're your Enfield delegation. Even though I have seven towns and Carol has two, we've had a couple little bit of growing pains, but not because of anybody's actions or inactions. But we are really in there fighting for Enfield uh, as much as humanly possible. And Democrat, Republican, it doesn't matter. We're your Enfield delegation, and we try to speak with one voice for our neck of the woods. And I just, it's a pleasure working with the two representatives sitting next to me. I've got Chris next yep. to me. Mr. Rutledge. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, State delegation, thank you. I know obviously you're really busy right now, so thank you for taking the time to speak to us. Um, I've, I've heard it mentioned a couple times that, not here, but in other forums that, um, the state might be looking for ways to allow municipalities to find other sources of revenue. Ms. Representative Renone, I think you either introduced or co-sponsored a bill like for lodging taxes or something like yes. that that would allow, um, which, you know, finding new sources of revenue to help, you know, spread the tax burden a little bit, I think can be a good thing. Um, my concern, though, is taking away a key source of revenue for in our case for the schools and that's related to senate bill 431 um i believe that bill basically re-examines the property tax and moves the property tax from municipal to a statewide thing um my biggest concern right there is that the prop the car tax you know is a is a significant portion of a town's revenue um it it funds a it funds a good deal of our school budget, and my concern with that bill, if it takes that away from the the um, municipality, is that where where is a town going to make up that money? Um, because you know, would there be a guarantee that whatever is taken out would have come back in through a cost sharing grant or through other you know state aid or anything like that? And you know, obviously the nine of us up here want to make sure our schools are properly funded. So I just like to hear your take on you know how would a town make up for that? or what's, you know, what's the little bit more detail on that bill? I'm just going to jump in and I'll go real quick. I oppose this totally. Uh, the state has a bad history of making promises to municipalities and then one or two years later pulling the rug out from underneath. Uh, this is, in my opinion, a way for President Pro Tem Marty Looney to shift money from some municipalities primarily to urban areas and nothing against our cities. But again, how do we make this up? And for my district, you may not be aware of this, but this is hugely important to the town to our south that I represent completely, Windsor Locks. I've met with their board of finance, and believe it or not, because of the Bradley International Airport, they have more rental cars in the little town of Windsor Locks than any other town or city in the state of Connecticut. And that car property tax makes up close to 20% of their entire town budget. So I've already been in contact with Senator Looney saying I don't support this. Uh, he, but he's looking to just fiddle with mill rates. But again, even if some money comes back to towns, in a couple of years, that's going to get whittled away. So I think it's a bad idea. Uh, I'm not against our urban areas, but this is a bad, bad, bad idea. And... Uh, Chris, I agree with you wholeheartedly. 
I'll just say ditto. I, I can't imagine this getting out of the, uh, the Senate, quite honestly. I mean, it, it's not only going to affect our towns, but it's going to affect basically all the suburban and rural towns in the state of Connecticut. So he would have to garner a huge amount of support from the rest of the state on this one. And I think most legislatures you talk to are looking out for the local municipalities, and, and they're just not going to stand for it. So over 5,000 bills come before the legislature each year. And this is just one of them, um, and, and that, I'll leave it at that. Uh, but the bill you said, uh, were talking about, which I, uh, I co-sponsored uh, with the uh, Windsor um, uh, representative, and it came from Windsor Locks. So it's, it's a hotel uh, tax over what we're, the state is getting today. So any money generated through that tax over from what the state revenue is today, which we can track, will go a uh, portion of that will go back to the towns this is the, the kind of you know extra revenue we need these kind of ideas and it's not my idea so i'm not this this came from windsor locks i, I only uh, helped it go through the system but it's so the state loses a couple years ago too a couple years for sure so so the state uh continues to get what they get every year and we get a piece of the increase so it's sure, it's in right. the town's best interest to um, make sure that they have, uh, you know, their hotels are occupied. So the more occupy, uh, occupancy you get in the hotels, the more money they can come back to the uh, teach every municipality. So it's, uh, um, you know, it's, it's a, 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 a encourages town to, towns to actually, you know, get people to come into their town and, and use their facilities. So it's just a small way. A lot of these bills are coming through, uh, through planning and development right now on my committee that are trying to help towns with some nonprofits um, that are questionable if they're, they're nonprofits or not, where you can be able to start taxing on those. Uh, I won't get into the, the uh, nitty gritty of it, but we're seeing a lot of those bills come through now to, to actually help uh, towns get some more revenue. So there's a lot of people out there think on both sides uh, thinking that way. So we just have to tone in on the best way. So, Mr. Rutledge. Yep, thank you very much. Ms. LeBlanc. I just want to thank you guys for talking to us about the tolls. It's such a hot topic here in Enfield. I think we're so unique because we're of where our position is, where Route 5 is. Um, you make a lot of valid points. I'm a commuter to Hartford. Um, fortunately, I either take the bus or commute in uh, with my husband, so we get to ride in the, the breakdown lane. But like you said, one accident, one little snafu, and I know for myself, uh, we jump right off the highway. <laughs> um, so You mean the express lane, not the breakdown lane? Yeah, did I say that? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Might as well to, call it that. I wanted to clarify that because I want cops walking in here. We knew exactly what You knew what I meant. <laughs> one heck of a bus. And when those Massachusetts drivers come through with one person in the car and the state troopers pull them over, I'm like, woohoo. <laughs> um, but um, I appreciate like your insight on the, all the tolls and where you stand on it um, and the fact that you kind of educated me a little bit more about it. I like to hear it straight from the people that are, that are talking about it. Um, one thing I'd like to say is although the election might not have gone as all of you would have wanted I hope you're finding a little bit reprieve in the leadership in, in the state of Connecticut I know the last few years were really rough with the things that Governor Marloy was doing and and the budget time was really trying and I can't imagine I know what we were going through as a town and a board um, and so then you guys having to, to do that but um, I'm you know I'm happy that you guys represent us well um, anytime I've had a question you've gotten back to me um, Representative Hall, so um, just keep us informed and thank you for doing all your work. Um, it seems like when you guys come here, you're enjoying what you're doing and, and letting us know. And um, all three of you have said it, you're, you're working for Enfield and your municipalities, so yeah. good luck. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. I think John said it best. I think you, you've got a delegation that works really well together. Um, and I don't think there's, for, I could speak for myself, but I, I pretty confident speaking for both of these gentlemen uh, there's no real big egos in the room as far as us we're we're more focused on what we can get for our town and and what you guys need so um, I think we really work very very well together we're certainly willing to give the governor an opportunity to 
prove to us we're not going down the same road as we've been down for the last uh, umpteen years yeah. with Governor Malloy. <laughs> um, yeah, so we're we're uh, we're staying on a positive note at this point. Um, the budget he put out obviously needs some work, especially under the teacher pension portion of it um, and some other aspects of it as well. But, you know, I think uh, his commitment to the municipality so far and to the education budgets um, I've been really encouraged with. So I'm going to stay positive and, and hope that kind of continues uh, for the uh, actually the health of the town. So. I just want to add, and I'm not excluding you, Senator Kissel, no, 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 no. but I'm just saying uh, with Carol and Tom, it's helpful because you guys were where we were. Mm -hmm. I mean, granted, you were on the town council, but Tom had had his experience on the Board of Ed, so um, I feel like that's a really good represent representation for us um, because you understand um, as far as your role and what we're looking for and just because the budget whether it's been in the capacity of being a representative or being on the town council or being on the board of ed um, you understand you know how hard it was for us and how hard it continues to be um, to live in the state of Connecticut so and it's it's funny being on appropriations we we have staff to prepare our numbers for us. so as soon as the budget was released you know I'm right on our representative who knows he he just looked at me as soon as the budget book was handed out and he goes don't even send me your email asking for the muni runs and the education runs I'm I've got them for you already so um, he he already anticipates the question so it's it's at the top of our all our radar I know as as a governor was giving his uh, uh, budget speech I was texting Chris with everything I was had my head down I was doing all the math and getting it out to him and then he sent it back well we already heard this <laughs> so I I still don't know how that happened and I've actually inquired about it <laughs> but uh, you yeah. never will know how <laughs> I may not ever know <laughs> Mr. Reddy uh, thank you Mr. Chairman um, I had a bunch of questions you guys answered when you first came out the gate so thank you uh, my last two questions uh, hinge on route five uh, we'll start closer to this section. Uh, I've been on this board for almost three years now, and we've been asking for a stoplight at Enfield High School, mm -hmm. and it's been three years, and there's still no light. So I don't know what the heck is going on with that. I have not seen anything move so slowly in regards to the safety of the kids coming in and out of that school. What do we have to do to knock doors down to get this light up? Okay, I'll, I'll let Carol go first, and then I'll comment. Sure. Um, so basically, uh, where we left it last, and it, it, we've had a change of manager since uh, that whole transaction between the state DOT and the town uh, was negotiated, um, we left it in the town's hands because the last commissioner from DOT did agree to put the light there. Um, and with the understanding that we would get reimbursed for the cost. So that was the, the deal that was made with DOT. Um, after that, I can't speak to what happened between the town. I mean, Tom might be able to talk to that a little bit, a but little bit. yeah, so. Yeah, so Carol's absolutely right. It was in the council's hands. We had a, a change in uh, town managers. Um, I'd like to easily say, well, then I'm off the council. I don't know what happened, but <laughs> but that's not true. So uh, we did. Uh, there was some unfortunate talk between DOT and the town that ended up being more negotiations. Uh, they were holding um, other items over our head to get that light, and uh, and then we had stopped and dropped negotiations with this particular uh, uh, person in DOT, and then we got a new town manager. So with that being said. We'll, we're back on it. So tomorrow morning, uh, I'll uh, I'll have all all our people uh, contact all three of us, and we'll we'll ask uh, and find out what's going on. We'll we'll ask Chris again and get it all recharged because be we were there, and right. and there, and then there was a, a an issue with DOT. They kind of uh, you know started uh, other negotiations that weren't fair to the town. So uh, we sat on it. So we need to re re gear that up with Chris now on the on the other side, Chris uh, Brompson. Right. Well, thank you guys for that. 
So just a just a quick comment too, because we have a, a meeting set up with uh, the new DOT commissioner coming up. Um, I would personally, I, I think that's a perfect opportunity to bring it up to him and just explain to him that we did have this agreement with the previous commissioner and just kind of push it uh, through. Uh, directly from the top down this time <laughs> might be uh, might be the expedient way to get it done. So we'll we'll definitely we'll look into that when we have a meeting. It's on. I think. And one other wrinkle: they wanted us to lose a light in another part of town. Well, thank you for saying that. <laughs> that was okay. exactly was the other problem. You know, the one over at the corner of Fermi. D O T. You're talking D O T. About? Okay. It's like I don't know. It's like they have a pocket of lights, and they can only give each municipality so many lights. I don't know. Uh, but they said, well, if you want a light here, then you got to lose a light there. Now, the other wrinkle to the Route 5 light in front of the high school is it violates all their protocols. You have to be so many feet away from, you know, like the South Road intersection and stuff like that. And they were, but we got to the point, Tom and Carol are exactly correct, where we, they were willing to waive all of that and get the light in there. But then out of the blue came the Fermi corner and then that brought us back to square one. It's like, why are you guys doing that to us? So so hopefully we can re, re, restart those discussions. Uh, trust me, every morning that there's school, I'm bringing my son down Route 5 and going into that entranceway. And so I see how, luckily, people are sort of very cool about it. But it, it, I would think that it's dangerous. And I'm not usually there when school gets out. And that could be even worse. So we, we hear you. Thank you. And the second uh, Route 5 question is, um, I'm glad that we're getting more money for ECS grant. Uh, here's the issue that I have is the more money that we get in, somehow Crec has this unbelievable ability to take our money. And it seems like there's no voice of reason that if they decide or if the state decides that, hey, you know what, we're going to up the bill, okay, we're just going to keep paying it. So if they up our ESC grants and then Crec's like, oh, we need more money, what's to stop them from coming in and just tapping us for money after month after month. Yeah, I, I can talk to you a little bit of that. In appropriations, uh, the correct budget is, they're looking for money this year. Um, and uh, their, their um, transportation money is being cut and they're not happy about it. Um, so the conversation has already been had on their behalf, not on, on appropriations, but on their behalf, they've already, I, I don't wanna say threatened, but they've made that um, assertion that they may go at the towns for, for some reimbursement money and up the, the cost to the town so it is it is a legitimate concern um, I, I there's no real good answer for them because quite honestly um, they've done really well over the years in their budget so they really shouldn't in my opinion uh, be coming looking for money from the towns um, so that discussion is to be had yet. Um, that's coming up in a lot of the subcommittee appropriations uh, discussions that we'll be having soon. I mean, and there's no, I mean, there's no hidden facets behind it. I mean, we have members that sit on their correct committee and they make no qualms about it. They, they say, we need money, we're going to the towns. So it's not a secret that they have. So what, what point do we have in, in Hartford to, to put a stop to it. Is it a bill? Is it a committee that says, listen, you guys can't just keep grabbing from the towns? Like, is there some, like, recourse for that? It would have to be a statute change. Right. So it would have to be a bill. Okay. And, and maybe that's something uh, we could look at also. Mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, bill the bills are, uh, you cannot sub, uh, you know, put any more bills in this year. Okay. Um, so next year, they have to be uh, fiscal bills. Um, this would be. Purportedly. So this, yeah. this purportedly, purportedly yeah. yes, it, or a committee bill. So it yep. could go through committee. So it would have to wait till next next year, but um, it's it's certainly something to look Just into. Just a stew on. Mm -hmm. Thank you, yes. guys. Yeah. Mr. Dresden. Since we have a captive audience, if I could just <coughs> add my two cents to that, and, and I agree it's frustrating from our <coughs> perspective, and I, I'm not trying to compare the, the programming that we give as a municipality as opposed to what the rest, I obviously am biased. Um, and I think one of the solutions is keep keep our kids home the best we can and create better programs for here for our kids not to have the incentive to go off. And that's not us against them mentality. But one of the things I'm sure those of you who have been there for quite some time may have heard some of these suggestions. The frustration from our perspective is that 
the timing of our budget process is not advantageous for the, the cycle that we deal with when it comes to the actual bill to come due with, with, with regards to our magnet school students. So as you know, I pr we propose a budget to the town council by March 1st. The council will deliberate, and by June 1st, we have to, the town has to make an appropriation to us. We are then you know, not essentially billed until the October 1 enrollment comes out from our magnet schools. Now, I, I will credit the state and whoever was behind some of the legislation in the past where there was a, that sort of statute of limitations on you know, if the, if the child doesn't complete the year that you won't get charged for the entire year. So that's been helpful. But the challenge that we have, and it seems to me to be a simple solution, and again, that would require the state to sort of foot the bill and then kind of bill us in arrears of, I can't budget right now. I have an exorbitant amount of money in this year's budget put aside for that potential increase in correct, um, correct tuitions, as, as Representative Hall mentioned earlier. I don't know. It's a crapshoot. I can't tell you if it's going to go up or down. I won't know until next October. And at that point, the, the horse is already out of the barn. But a simple solution to me and, and colleagues of mine that we've discussed has been, is it feasible for, this, for, for our tuition bill to sort of be one year in arrears, meaning we conclude the end of the year. So I'm going to budget next year based on my current enrollment this year and whatever the set rate is. So at least I know going into it. So my you know fiscal year 2020, I know what my bill is going to be. And then we essentially we have to square up at the end of the year. So if my if I was if I had sent more students and my bill was increased, at least going forward, I know that I can put that budget and it's a set number and vice versa. Mm -hmm. If my bill is less this year, then we can work on crediting it back somehow. It's all going to the same place. Okay. That's a point of frustration that I know colleagues and I have ha been having for years um, about just giving us a better idea to plan. So as these folks have to put the budget together and a town council is required to put a budget together, there's this unknown question mark of there could be potentially up to you know half a million to almost a million dollars worth of unknowns that we're going to have to take away from somewhere else to plan for what could possibly be an increase. So that's just my two cents on it, and I promised I wouldn't speak tonight, but I could help. <laughs> that's right. It's like special needs. You, you, you know, they float into your district, and all of a sudden, boom, you get hit with it. Mm -hmm. And these are the ideas dears we need, too, for, uh, you know, bills in the future, uh, you know, to make sure we're doing our job and in introducing the right legislation that helps our towns in the future. And, and uh, that's, I, I think, uh, we could always do, um, you know, more of. And uh, uh, it's still, it's, uh, you know, one in 5,000 shot, but it's something we, we should be doing uh, as frequently as possible. My turn? Well, it's actually not my turn. It's, it's Vice Chairman Charlotte Riley's turn, because she's watching at home, and she asks, and I'm not going to raise my voice like her, <laughs> um, the ECS formula was played with last year. Are we using that new formula? I, yeah, so that, I, I did mention that just yeah. in the, that, that there's the governor's uh, formula, which is a new formula. That's the numbers that you got tonight. And there are last year's formula from the, the uh, legislature's formula from last year. And that's, uh, so, you talked about it last year, how that was going to be re, a new formula. Or yes. Right. But that is the new formula. So, so just just yeah, a, just Explain a clarification. It to us in layman terms. So, <laughs> so, uh, just to give you an idea, what happened was the governor put together his own formula for ECS, um, and it was it worked with the teachers' pension portion of how he was breaking that those up throughout the towns and the cities. So he used his own formula in the governor's budget. Last year's formula came out of the budget that came out, that was voted out by the whole legislation, the Senate and the House. So that, the, the compromised budget. Yeah. So that ECS formula was different than the one we're looking at in the governor's budget. What would have happened if the, the numbers from the ECS budget from last year stayed in place, your numbers would still be up. And if you remember, we talked about that last year, that the numbers looked really good in the compromise budget for Enfield. So we were ahead either, either formula. But that being said, we don't know if they're going to continue using that formula from last year or if it's going to be a hybrid of the governor's formula 
and last year's formula. So until the budget gets out of appropriations, we really won't know what we end up with. So that's the final, that's the final. It's like, it's like formula 409 or formula 410. It is, 410. it is. I mean. Yeah. It's, it's, it, it's so, it, it's a convoluted process, I agree, yeah. <laughs> Mr. Rutledge, you want one more question? Um, actually, yeah, oh. kind of so as a follow-up to that, w once the formula is actually figured out, could we actually get that formula? Yes. Mm -hmm. All right. Yes. Yeah. Did you have something to say? And what I was just going to add is that at least between the compromise budget of last year and the governors of this year, it's an actual formula. Right. <laughs> because we were calling it a formula in prior years, but all of a sudden, if like the co-chair of appropriations, nothing against my former colleague, Senator Beth Bayh, but all of a sudden we'd wake up and West Hartford would get a ton of extra money. So they were, it was not a real formula in practice. So at least now we're proceeding down the path of, well, is this the right kind of formula or is this one? But at least it's a formula where certain municipalities, whether they're cities or suburbs, do not benefit because they have legislators in certain positions of power during any given session. Right. Mr. Neville, one more time. Thank you for your candor. I've been doing this for eight years, and I've heard the ECS formula, which you're telling me now really wasn't a formula, which I always thought anyway, and it always changed every year. And so for those of us sitting in the trenches here trying to come up with a reasonable budget, okay, we have no idea what's coming out. And the citizens who are reading about this in the paper have to be going crazy as well. I mean, I, we've asked for the formula before. You guys couldn't give it to us. I understand why, but what's it based on? I mean, I, you know, we have, you're talking about two formulas now, mm -hmm. okay? Yep. What are they based on? What do they factor in? Uh, and, and I think, it, what weighs it to go one way or the other? I, 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 have, I don't have a clue. So the governor used some different, you know, you the governor used um, some different criteria this year. He used a combination of uh, what we're paying our teachers um, so the higher paid, the towns that pay their teachers more are getting less, um, which to me, I, I, a lot of the rationale doesn't make a lot of sense to me. But anyway, um, that being said, that's part of the formula. The other part of the formula is free and reduced lunches. Um, and then there was another part of the formula that was based on your city's gross revenues and incomes. That was more, more towards last year's formula. So it was kind of a hybrid of a little bit of everything, his formula. Um, and the Department of Education would definitely give you an answer that says, there was a definitive formula. I think what the senator was talking about was all the pork that got put in by certain legislators for different favors for districts. So if you called the Board of Education in Hartford, they would tell you this is the formula. Um, but there was a lot of excess money that went to other districts for no apparent reason that was put into their ECS money. So, you know, that's, if you ask them, they will, they will produce a formula for you, so. Thank you, Carol. I'm just surprised that nowhere in that litany of things you just gave us was there anything about learning. We give, you know, right, you're you're right. got to learn how to calculate the formula. <laughs> right, right. So, so the, between the two formulas, the, the governor's formula and the formula that was of last year are $50,000 apart. So they're very close. So we, either way they go, they're going to be, uh, and then hopefully we can, you know, get that breakdown of what the end result is so we can all see it. If, and hopefully it's not too, too complicated like some I've seen. I don't intend to be sarcastic. You guys are doing a wonderful oh, no, job. No. You, you know, you wonder sometimes that you're here for a long period of time. You know, it's, sometimes things just don't change. I know, and uh, it I sounds know. like it's changing. And, and uh, I, I have full confidence in the three of you that you're going to do the best for us and for Enfield. Thank, Thank, you. Thank you. And I've seen some bills, too, are trying to align the uh, fiscal years up for municipalities, too, this year. The, the only one I saw, though, was to, to align it with the federal, um, uh, uh, the federal budget. 
So, and, and I haven't done a lot of analysis on that to see if it would hurt or help. But there are, there are some talk of also that too, starting to align the municipalities up with the state budget so we don't have to go through what you are gonna go through soon. But hopefully this will be pretty, pretty solid so we can move through without having another last year. So not to bore you more, but I'm a binder guy. So I printed our state constitution. Article 8, there shall always be free public elementary and secondary school in the state. The General Assembly shall implement this principle by appropriation legislation. Section 2, the state shall maintain a system of higher education. The word maintain is not free. It's not provide, it's maintained by tuitions. Mm. So then you were saying at the council meeting how they want to give free tuition to higher education. Well, right. they can go pound sand right? because well, it's unconstitutional. Well, just can I talk yeah, to and, that? Yeah, and, and so we, we have, as known to community college in this town, which is, I tell you, I can't tell you how many times I've sat in, in meetings in the state for manufacturers meetings and the first ACC and Enfield gets mentioned because it's the most f fabulous manufacturing. Uh, uh, in Walter, it's right down your alley. You know, they're, gonna... they're putting out quality uh, uh, workforce for every manufacturer throughout the state. It's a gem. Um, so, d do we look at a Massachusetts model where somebody uh, that is maybe less fortunate that comes out of high school with great grades that that they're able to grant them through? Again, these are hybrids we need to look at, too, to make sure that we, we continue to get this, the uh, talent we need through our community college systems. And I'm not sure, I'm sure some of these bills are, you know, looking for the free, uh, you know, totally free um, um, look at it. But there are ways for people that live in Connecticut that, that are able to, like in Massachusetts, that are able to, you know, move through the system um, with reduced and sometimes free tuition if they stay in, uh, in Connecticut and be a doctor for X amount of years. If, these are the bills I like, if they stay in manufacturing for five years and, and, and stay in Connecticut. So there are things I think that could, you could sell me on, on something like that, but not, not free tuition. Well, I was, I was gonna add that the, the as none talk or any, any technical school is okay, but to, to give someone at UConn free education or Central, no, that's not. And, that's and, what tuitions are. That's and some doc, today there's a shortage of, of many of the medical fields. So uh, yeah. uh, public health, that, that's my another uh, uh, committee I'm on. So we're hearing shortages in everything. And, and most uh, in a lot of the doctors associations, they would love to to start a program with the state of Connecticut to keep those uh, doctors in this state in low uh, uh, income areas where they can, you know, really help the poor. So those kind of models, I think, are, f are phenomenal. And we could, from nurses, RNs, there, there seems to be a shortage in everything in medical. Can, so I'm sorry. Ahead, I mean, no, 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 no. And you're doing a great job, Tom. I would just chime in that I, when I, we, a few years ago, I was co-chair program review and investigations we have since uh, taken that committee away to save some money in the legislature but I commissioned a study on the affordability and accessibility of Yukon and it was a it was just incredible to see the arrogance I hate to say it of the administrators at the University of Connecticut and they said well we want the best and the brightest so we're gonna pay top dollar and these are lots and lots of folks making six-figure salaries and they didn't really care that this necessitated the increase in tuition. That's A. B, I'm proud of the fact that my son Nathaniel, probably like around six or seven years ago now, graduated from Enfield High School, National Honor Society, high honors, but he didn't really know what he wanted to do, still doesn't. Uh, so I made him sort of apply to a variety of schools. He got into every single one of them. He got into Pratt. He got into UConn. He had the, de the department chair at UConn seek him out. He hated that school because that's my alma mater in part. He just didn't feel a good vibe. He got into schools in New York State. But I got to be honest, I'm not crying poor, but it doesn't help our family to get a $40,000 scholarship to a $60,000 school. So let me jump forward. Ultimately, he decided to go to a Stunta Community College. And when he did that, Knowing he got into all those other schools, I'll be honest, I felt, well, I wouldn't say embarrassed, but awkward. 
The more parents I have spoken to about that decision, the more they have said, I wish my son or daughter had made that decision. Because we sent them to this school, they didn't like it. Now we go to this other school that's less expensive. They like that school, but we've got this $30,000 loan we gotta pay off or whatever. Greatest thing about Nathaniel is he's got his associate's degree now, trying to figure out part two of the process, but zero debt. Now, at the graduation ceremony, which took place last spring, we had President Lambella, people from the Board of Trustees, and you know what they said, and this goes to your point, Mr. Chairman. You folks <clears throat> are unique students. Some of you are traditional 18, 19, 20, 21, but some of you are changing careers because you wanted to move or maybe job change. Many of you are parents. Some of you are single parents. And most of you probably worked at the same time you studied to pay your tuition. And they all said in a unified voice, employers are going to love you because you proved you can juggle all those things and still succeed. The cost of a community college education, while it still is money and you gotta go out and earn it, for most folks, they can make it work. As an attorney, when I was in private practice, when I would do pro bono, a lot of times I would have people that didn't respect what I gave them because they didn't have any skin in the game. They weren't paying anything. When you pay even a modest amount, it means it has value. So this notion that we're gonna wave a magic wand with money we don't have to say everybody gets a free community college education, A, I don't think we can afford it. B, I think it devalues the value of a community college education. And C, I don't think at the end of the day those students will profit as much as if they have to struggle just a little bit. So to my mind, the problem in the higher ed process is not the community colleges. It's the University of Connecticut and now following suit as our state university system that is just getting more and more out of reach for typical middle class families. So I can talk directly to those bills um, being on higher ed. Um, and it's been an interesting dialogue because there were a ton of free college bills that came out of the higher ed committee. Um, and of course, I didn't support any of them. Um, and here's why, not because I don't think it's a great concept. I think conceptually, it's a fantastic concept if we can offer two years free um, to, our, to our students. However, when we don't fund our primary and secondary level education right now, why are we going to add another two years to burden our, our state when we can't even cover what our obligations are to our, our primary and secondary education system? So for me, conceptually, I, I love the idea of two years of free community college. I have to agree to disagree. Well, I, I, I think it's a great idea. I think if we were flush with money and um, we can fund our schools that we're obliged to fund now, um, I think it's it's a lofty uh, goal to, to reach. So, um, however, that being said, what, what isn't told and what isn't said very clearly out there, and it came right from uh, President Ajokian, 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 Ajakian, um, just recently that 60% of our community college students go for free, 60%. That's a huge number. So the Pell Grants that are coming down from the federal government are funding quite a lot of our community college students' education. So um, it's, it came directly from the president himself saying there is no for foreseeable way that he sees uh, free college uh, in this state knowing his budget situation and knowing where the rest of the state is right now. So. It was an interesting, we had an eight hour forum today 
eight hours uh, in higher ed on um, the, the regionalization and the combining of the community colleges, very hot topic right now and very divided. So that was an interesting day. <laughs> well, it all boils down to this document. And there is, even in this document, it talks about the, the school fund, which was formed back in the 1800s, that paid for K through 12. That's it. Mm. That's all. Well, Special ed. We were supposed to pay four and a half times what a regular student cost and then get reimbursed from the state. Right. We only get reimbursed 73 percent. 73 percent. That's so, against the law, period. Right, right. Because they get the money from the Fed. So where where is the other 20? I can't do math that fast. 27 percent. Well, it's interesting because when we brought that up in higher ed, um, nobody had the answer to it. Um, so, which is kind of it's kind of an oxymoron, right? Nobody has the answer in higher ed. So, um, but anyway, and that's federal law. So, so somebody's violating federal law. <laughs> that's a good one, Carol. I know. Hours, that's good. <laughs> no, like, um, so anyway, that being said, it, it's kind of funny because um, you you look at the numbers and and they're they're staggering. You know, um, what we were able to kill uh, of coming out of higher ed, there was. Uh, they were proposing a constitutional amendment to add the other two years to their present obligation of the primary and secondary. So luckily, um, that was killed in committee. The whole higher education committee is, to me, isn't even constitutional either. So right. well, that should be a committee that should be dissolved, period. But that's yeah. another story. <laughs> Back to the contracts that Mr. Neville mentioned. Yeah. When the contract, when the state took over the contracts, they threw in binding arbit arbitration. Now mm -hmm. they want to give it back to us. That's again violation of, of a contract that we had, that the state would fund the, the, the pensions when they threw in binding arbitration. Now you know, so they take share. so so one yeah, of the comments. They share, yes. One of the comments. Again, so get rid of the binding arbitration if you're going to give us the, the throw us back the. Uh, the, the pension yeah, the liability. Pensions. So one of the discussions in, in appropriations, and it came from, I believe it was the governor's office. I, I have to look at my notes. But basically their, their thought of passing that obligation on to the town is they felt that it would give the town's skin in the game if they had skin to, the when they're in the contract negotiating process, to keep the the contracts down if there was some obligation to contribute to the teachers but that was a that's a direct quote almost so uh, Can we do that now we, we keep the make, contracts we going can't now make this up. No. and just well, let me, one more thing i'm sorry one more so i did that i did that now back to the higher education what about next year asking for a forensic audit of all the state colleges Finding out what we pay these professors, what they do, do they teach, do they not teach, the adjunct professors, all these people. Yeah, yeah I just asked. Get a forensic audit of all these schools. I didn't ask for an audit, um, Walter, but I did ask for a budget, which they, they actually produced a document this year, which was a little bit more detailed. Um, but we actually had bills put into higher ed looking for a forensic audit and for a line item budget out of both uh, systems, out of UConn and the community college systems, and those were killed. And, oh, yeah. It would show everybody what, what's we, being done we there. Tried so. to, I tried to, our side tried to push them out, but I they, have one more comment, but I'll, I'll, Mr. Blank still had something to add. Uh, you don't even have to respond to this. It just felt like it was something I had to share with you because you're talking about the higher ed bills right now. Um, I'm, I just signed my life away for my second kid to go to college. Um, I totally believe in community college, especially if a student doesn't know what they want to do mm -hmm. because they can get out there and explore. My niece is a perfect example. She thought she wanted to do one thing. She's at community. She knows what she wants to do, and she'll be applying you know, further from there. I think the problem is, is that if you are a middle class family with two working parents, you are basically in big trouble for college because our Connecticut state schools are more expensive than the mass schools. The Connecticut state schools will give you zero dollars. Yeah. The private schools, which are more expensive, end up giving you grants so that when you're looking at it, 
and you can spend the same amount to go to a private school, maybe with smaller class sizes, and you're paying out of pocket for state school, I find more parents, including myself, are opting to go to the private school. Some states, like New York, if you're a resident of the state, you have a really big, like the SUNY schools, you have a really um, good rate as going to a SUNY school if you're a New York resident. Some states, like North Carolina, they're offering different residency grants so you can apply to their school and if you qualify, you get the residence tuition. Um, a lot of the state colleges here make it very hard for Connecticut students to get into. Mm -hmm. And a lot of their programs, I think, are behind the times. Like take nursing, for example. I had a nursing student. She would have been direct accepted into the nursing programs in the Massachusetts state schools, but she wouldn't have been direct ex accepted here. And basically, you have a school like Southern telling her, well, you have to go undeclared for two years, then apply to the program, possibly 150 applicants for 60 spots. Wow. And there's no guarantees, so have a backup major. I'm not going to invest in a Connecticut school if there's no guarantees for that, that student to go forward in a nursing program. Right. So it was definitely more of a Massachusetts situation. So um, when I hear about you know different things and different aid, I find through the college process that the middle class are hurt a lot. Mm -hmm. And you know we're actually talking as a family about relocating after my youngest graduates just over the line to Massachusetts. And I know Massachusetts has a problem but like you're saying we want these kids to go to school in Connecticut but we want them to stay in Connecticut right. the sad reality is it's very hard with the for these kids with the student debt to to stay in Connecticut and maintain a good life because this debt is nothing like what I came out of college with right. and I do believe my kids need to to accrue the debt that you know we we do the things and the scholarships and the grants and apply for different things like that. But um, I always felt when I had to pay for my own school, so like you said, there's skin in the game and they have to work for it. But I just don't find that Connecticut is helpful to middle class families at all. And maybe it's like that all over the United States, but uh, it's very disheartening, especially with the Connecticut state schools. So the, the Massachusetts model of state schools too, they're starting to reach out over the line. Westfield College now is starting to offer tuition to Connecticut residents too. We so are they're in already state at Westfield, right. Yeah. They're already yeah. starting to reach out over and, and pull our students uh, into there. I don't know what Massachusetts model costs them, and that's that's a huge, uh, you know, as we talk budget here, that's a huge uh, uh, unanswered question. Uh, but one of the greatest stories is is again our community college, two years around a B average, transfer to UConn finish out with a full four-year UConn degree. That's a phenomenal, we should take more advantage of that. Uh, uh, and again, having all my children going through college, that those are, the, those are great ideas uh, to be able to get that full, full uh, four-year uh, university for half the price. Actually, and as they, they have a lot of partnerships, like as Nuntuck uh, is partnered with Elms. So yep. we know somebody that graduated from two years through as Nuntuck, and she's taking some sort of forensic uh, program through as Nuntuck, but her degree is actually going to be through Elms College. I know Holyoke Community College out in, in Holyoke, they have a lot of partnerships because there's so many uh, colleges nearby, like Springfield College and stuff like that. I just feel like... Um, I'm really disheartened by the college experience and what Connecticut has to offer and what they'll help you with. And I know the federal aid is a, is a federal thing and, and stuff like that, but it's it's really hard um, for the working class family. So when you hear that there's other opportunities out there that, again, you're not going to qualify for, it, it's frustrating because what it looks like we can afford isn't always what you can afford, and we'll have number three in three years going to college, too. So, Mr. Double. Just, just to pick up on that, we're doing things with Stick up in, in Springfield. Our high school is doing that in a, in a, uh, a collaborative agreement with them. They can pick up the, um, the credits, some of the mechanical engineering credits, stuff like that here. They'll be starting that, and then they'll be able to transfer them to Stick, okay? And then they'll they have to pay so much a credit for for the, the credits up there, and their credits transfer to Northeastern, so they can get two years here at the pretty much the rate that we have at the Asnantic rate. And stick it very comparable, and then they can take that down to uh, actually the University of New Haven on another program, but also uh, uh, Northeastern University. Mm -hmm. so, so you get two years at a, wow. at a community college rate, and you can end up getting into a, an engineering program down there. There's all kinds of opportunities, but I don't think we we take we take advantage of them. I think at the community college level, we don't do it at the four-year college level, the state college level. And I, somebody has to. She, she's absolutely right. Yeah. You learn this when you put your kids through school, as you guys have, oh, yeah. have already found out. Oh, yeah. That's where you learn how 
wow, this is so much different and it's, and it's so expensive. Yeah. And it doesn't have to be, I don't think. Yep. Agreed. All right, we've taken enough of their time. I just have one more thing to add. You have a short agenda tonight. <laughs> I have one more thing to add. I was thinking the same thing. You guys are going to be here. Just to, just to throw numbers out there. Years ago, when I had a bunch of my friends got married, we had stag parties. When I went around with $15 tickets, they sold like hotcakes. When I went around with $20 tickets, I couldn't get no one to buy them. The lower the taxes, the more you get. It just boils down to that. It's just a simple concept. Lower the taxes, we'll get more revenue. It always works. So I'll leave it at that. I thank you, all thank three you. of you, for coming. Thank you for Spending having us. Spending a good here. hour with us here. And thank you. And more. Thank you and, for everything and, you guys and, do. Thanks and, for and, all the and dedication. No, thank you for, for all you do down at Hartford for us. I don't want to travel down that road. <laughs> <laughs> I'll stay up here and work, and you guys do all the work down there. Matt. <laughs> yeah, did you have any finals or something you had to study Not for? Yet. Not yet. I'm sorry. We'll, we'll, we'll get an excuse here for you. Matt, Matt knows how to handle it. <laughs> Number seven, superintendent's report. Well, well, we're going to start with the aforementioned Matt. <laughs> so he can go home and start his 10 page paper. If you want to leave after this, you may. Go right out. Um, I really don't have that much news, ironically. Um, but this Friday from 7 to 9 p.m. in the cafeteria is the Enfield Arts Festival um, at Enfield High. And also Saturday from 12 p.m. to 3 p.m. All juniors will be taking the SAT tomorrow morning, March 27th. So good luck to them. And some really good news is April vacation is in a couple weeks. And I know that's town-wide, but we're definitely very excited for that in particular. Okay. And that's it. And we're adding to that because we don't we're not gonna be here either that yeah. week. So. Yeah. Yay. They gave us they gave us the week <laughs> off too. Mr. Mr. Dresick. Okay, really quick. Matt actually took a lot of what I had to say, which is a good news. Uh, we, just a reminder that all schools are on an early release date this coming Thursday, the twenty eighth for students. Um, faculty will be in professional development. As a reminder, spring vacation starts on the April the week of April eighth through the twelfth. As a reminder, the board has canceled their April 9th meeting because of that vacation. And lastly, all schools and offices will be closed on good for observation of Good Friday on uh, April 19th. And if you can recall, we did not have to cancel that this year. Uh, there's, as Matt mentioned, there's information about the Arts Festival, the National Junior Honor Society induction ceremony, and Family Steam Night in your packets, as well as a list of April events. And that concludes the superintendent's report. Any questions for the superintendent? No, Matt, please, if you need to. Good luck on your paper. Yes. Number eight, audiences. Reminder, you have three minutes. And we have Nemo. Name and address for the record. And speak into the microphone. Is the red light on? Push the button. Sorry. Akua Nemo, 880 Selene, Enfield, Connecticut. Good evening, everyone. Um, today, March 26th, will be my last time coming here. I'm not going to come here about my children anymore because I think that people are playing with my intelligence when it comes to my children's life. It's very sad what's going on right now. Today I was picking up my little one. She's happy where she is right now, like very good school. But I was picking her at 2 p.m. and then the teacher and the counselor pulled me off and said they went to Lego while they was doing Lego, um, they was planting of animals, and they gave all the kids book to write what they see about the animals. Julia thinks she present was sad, 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 sad. So they have to pull her out and ask her why she's sad. 
She told them that she's fine. She came home. She said, Mommy, the thing we build was the thing they told me I was. And since people call her that name, it has affected my child so bad. I have stuff here in my pocket. I don't want to show it on the record because it's very, very, very sad note and stuff like that going on. And I have a record why this child is just crying, asking why she's alive. Coming here, I saw on the news, 10-year-old commit suicide. I don't sleep at night because I'm afraid what she would do. Last week, my, my 16-year-old came home. That incident was happening. I went to the meeting. I, I had a great conversation with the superintendent. And she said, Mommy, I don't want to take this anymore. If this happened again, I'm going to hit somebody in the school. And then yesterday, she came home crying, saying, going to class, somebody just showed me on the phone. I'm in the look, look, look at your pictures right here. And it's getting too much hateful thing. People taking my children picture and putting hate stuff on it. And it's like people are taking this like not issue. Meanwhile, my children are suffering. You know, I don't want to speak too much here because my next step is I'm going to tell their father. I was trying not to tell no, no family member. I have huge family in America here and back home. I was trying not to involve nobody and trying to do this on my own. But I've, I have seen that it doesn't go nowhere and my children are suffering. It's just sad that people has taken me as a fool and playing with my intelligence. I'm going to have to stop you there. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. Any other audiences? Okay, so you're done with mine, right? You, you want, your three minutes is up, yes. Yes, sir. So what's my reply with all my We don't, right we don't, here. we don't, we don't go back and forth. I'm sorry. Really? We, we don't, we, it's not part of our, it's not in our. Um, can I ask you, do you have children? Again, I can't speak back and forth with you, please. That's what you're saying. It's, it's part of our policy. We can't, we can't I speak was trying not to show you things. Come and see this, sir. Please, please. See, see things like this. If your child will write things like this, or your grandchildren, your nephew, okay, writing things like this, it's I, okay. I can't, we can't go If back. somebody take your picture and write N word and put animals on and put it on the internet, is that okay? Okay, I cannot, we cannot communicate back and forth. I'm sorry. That's not, what you're saying. It's not in Thank our you. agenda. Sorry. When I go through the law, then you will see who I am. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any other audiences? John Wing, 12 Hamlet Drive, um, Hentitino. Um, I just, <laughs> I, uh, yes, yes, we have to add, and I'm I about do. to get on I your do. three minutes. Please add what, the, what this gentleman is to you. So. Uh, my name is John LeBlanc. He's my nephew. <laughs> <laughs> now I will start the three. Everybody minutes. knows now. All right. If you didn't already. Um, anyways, um, I just wanted to, I said it at the uh, town council, and I wanted to say it here too, uh, in front of the board of ed, uh, JCW, or I, I JCJ. said that at town council too. JCJ, the architecture firm that is going to be working on JFK. Um, I encourage anybody. I did. I went online and I looked at some of the work they did at other schools and places. They don't only do schools, but they do a lot of work at schools, and uh, it's really good work that they do. So, uh, if anybody wanted to see things they've done in the past, just you can type in JCJ and. Uh, on Google and it'll come up and I think they'll do a really really good job with JFK as well so I just wanted to come up here and say that to you all, all right. thank, you. thank you sir any other audiences all right we'll declare audiences closed um, board com board member comments you want to start Rich sure 
Uh, I just wanted to start off with uh, welcoming all the uh, guests that we have this evening. Um, everything that they had um, presented to us. Um, the awards, uh, the student athletes putting student first, which was great. Um, just wanted to give a um, big shout out uh, to Mr. Lamosa and Dr. Wiley for their 3-5 math nights. Uh, I had the ability to attend uh, the one they had at Crandall. Um, it was great what they were putting out there. Um, parents were really well receptive to it. Um, stuck on the old ways of doing math as, as many people are. Um, but it was good to see uh, them explain why math is being done a little bit differently. So kudos to them and um, I know that there's, there's a bigger, bigger scheme in getting more families involved in regards to um, bringing families out and possibly providing some games during the summer so people don't start the academic slide uh, once summer hits. So a lot of good things to come from the school district. And um, that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Reggae. Mr. Poe? I actually don't really have any other comments because Rich kind of said what I wanted to talk about. Um, and we don't really have any Enfield Street School PTO updates until after the break either. So really nothing from me. Mr. Rutledge. Um, mine will be short as well. Just want to remind everybody on April 26th, the uh, ERFC is hosting their Toast of the Town fundraiser. It's, at, uh, it's in the evening at the Old Country Deli. And if you want tickets, they're still available at erfcinc.org. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rutledge. Ms. LeBlanc. Um, I would just like to thank the legislators that were here again tonight. Um, it's like once a year isn't enough to sometimes see them and we kind of all that's why it runs so late because um, I think we have people at the state level that we feel we can talk to they're approachable uh, they're invested and uh, they act they enjoy what they do and they enjoy being the liaisons uh, for the town of Enfield so I want to thank them um, I congratulated all the student athletes and um, I just want everyone because I'm not gonna be here for April break um, everybody to have a safe and happy um, and healthy April break. Mr. Devil. First of all, <clears throat> every time we come here in, uh, on appreciation night, it's it's just it's refreshing. It, uh, Mr. Rainier stole all of my comments, and thank you very much. I mean, I'll I'll be very very all brief right, so, tonight. So, so cut, shut your mic. <laughs> <laughs> but um, you know, <clears throat> I know we all go home some nights and say, why did we do this again? You know. That's the reason why we did it, okay? Just clear, you know, plain and simple. Um, and uh, thanks for bringing the little ones here. Uh, they're special and, um, you know, it just, it just makes my day. Um, but uh, Mr. Rennie was correct in saying that the kids, their parents, the citizens of this town, that's what this is all about. It ain't about us, okay? I'm glad we all get along and we, we all here for the same reason. But it's about them. That's the only reason we would ever do this for two, four, six, eight years, Tina. Yeah, it's because of them. And so, and I appreciate their being here. Um, having our athletes here, we've had them here for eight years. They come in every season. And it's great. It's really nice to hear the emphasis that they're putting on. And again, I'm stealing your comments on and Tina's on academics. Um, they were truly student athletes. That that's that's a goal. They want to get their kids on the honor roll. They want their kids to do that. They want their kids also to get involved in the community. Just about every team, I think. I may have missed one, but they're all doing something to kind of play it down, to, you know, to to the rest of the community. And I, I just that's you're talking about well-rounded student athletes, and you're talking about role models and the, and the coaches who are really teachers. Uh, it's just fabulous. Um, and and finally, I thank you for the for our. Um, our legislators coming in. Yeah, I agree that this was they're a friendly group of people. I think we feel close to them. I think because of the things you said that they've been in our shoes, and we know, we knew them when they were in our shoes, and we so we we have a relationship with them. I don't think you can always understand somebody who hasn't done what you're doing. They they don't always get it, and I think they get it in terms of that, and they understand the work that we do, and I think it's 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 good that we understand the the work they do for Enfield. Um, a final thing is, um, well, I'll leave it go. At this thank you, Mr. Neville. Again, I'd like to thank our legislatures. They get it, but they got to remind everybody there, K through 12 is the only thing that should be a poor constitution. And they get it, but we got to get the rest of them to get it. Um, 
I forgot to mention to them that they should take that video down from the kite uh, video and show it to sort of people down there because that's to show what we do up here and and um, there was some, something else on the top of my head, but I can't forget. So we'll leave it at that. Number ten on finish on finished business, we have none. Number eleven, new business approval for school readiness grant application, Mr. Drezek. Thank you, Chairman. In your packet is the. It is in their packet. Right? It's not in their packet, so I apologize. I don't have the copy of it in your packet. I don't. Just a, there's just an explanation. There's an of explanation one. of it in okay. your packet. Um, but I'm going to welcome someone you may know from the FRC, but she's here in her role as answering questions for is Amy Morales, um, and she can answer any questions on the school readiness grant application that I'm we trying to. We apologize. It's nine o'clock. So that's okay. Uh, so, um, as uh, Mr. Jezik said, I'm still the Family Resource Center Coordinator. I've taken on the School Readiness Liaison role as of July 1st. Um, so the RFP for the School Readiness Grant was released by the Office of Early Childhood. And for that, for the School Readiness Grant and the Quality Enhancement Grant, um, which will provide 249872 for 28 preschool slots in Enfield, and then $3,881 in training funds. The grant is open to all qualified programs serving young children in Enfield through a local application process, which is coordinated by KITE, which serves as our school readiness council in Enfield. Um, so the qualifications established by legislation include programs that, that have to be accredited or in the process of becoming accredited. Um, KITE sent out the public notice to the local early childhood community on March 5th. We also did a public notice in the Journal Enquirer. The applications are due back to KITE on April 26th and then will be reviewed and scored by a um, committee that KITE will put together, a joint review committee. The grant requires um, joint submission by the town manager and superintendent, um, and the, the um, town council approved it at their last meeting. So if there's any questions, I can answer. Any questions? Mr. Neville. Where is the money coming from? The Office of Early Childhood. Okay, Connecticut or, or federal? Connecticut, Connecticut. state. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's open to all uh, groups like yours? It's open to any um, eligible um, preschool program. So they have, there's certain qualifications they have to meet. So they have to be accredited. Um, they have to fund um, <laughs> year-round programs. There's a whole list of um, qualifications that they have to meet to okay. be able to apply. And what's the term of the, of the grant? It's a two-year grant. From starting when? Is this for July 1st. July 1st um, um, is yes, coming here. Okay. Correct. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? So do we need to do anything here? Or, so we need a motion to approve the school readiness grant application. Second. Moved by Mr. Rutledge, seconded by Ms. LeBlanc. Any other discussion? And Roll call, please. Mr. Renier? Yes. Mrs. DePoe? Yes. Mr. Rutledge? Yes. Mrs. LeBlanc? Yes. Mr. Neville? Yes. Chairman Cruzel? Yes. Motion passes. Thank, Thank you so you. much. I'll be back for my FRC grant probably in a couple months. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry. Up on the agenda. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's usually not this long, Amy. Yeah. yeah. Don't come back when the legislature's coming. <laughs> exactly. That was a tough one. We're athletes, yeah. All Karen's fault. 11, 11B, approval remaining 4,000 series policies for its reading. Mr. Renier. Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. So tonight we are uh, approving the remaining 4,000 series um, that have been coming before us. Um, there are some uh, grammatical um, fixes that uh, Mr. Poe will share with us. Uh, but just for context, this is the 5,000, and the 4,000 was about the same size. So that's addition to what we currently have, what Cabe suggests, what Cabe <laughs> suggests we should have, what the federal law says we should have. So this is what we have to go through. So uh, tonight we are looking to approve uh, for the first reading the 4,000 series. So do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Moved by Mr. Rutledge, seconded by Mr. Neville. Any discussion? Yeah, is there anything substantive? I, I went through them today, but there's a lot to go through. Um, and uh, and the, some of it's been there forever. Okay. There's no changes to anything that we're currently doing. Uh, the only things that there are changes on is just wording uh, and putting in state law um, and general statutes at the end of the policies that we didn't currently have. That's it. That's fine. There's but no a lot problem. of the forms that um, accompanied a lot of the, a lot of the state law um, that we need to put in there, we already have, and we already had forms for them prior to. Okay. So they just suggested other forms that were kind of ill prepared. To be honest with you, our forms are much better. 
as, as it always is in Enfield, right? Okay. Good job. Thank you. And if I remember right, we're just aligning our policies with, yeah. with Cabe, so we're, yeah. so we're all on the same page. Any other discussion? Roll call, please. Mr. Renier? Yes. Mrs. DePoe? Yes. Mr. Rutledge? Yes. Mrs. LeBlanc? Yes. Mr. Neville? Yes. Chairman Cruzel? Yes. Motion passes. 12 board committee reports, 12A curriculum. Mr. Neville. We met on... Uh, Microphone, sorry. We met on March 14th, just to wrap up a couple of things from the February meeting. Uh, basically, we had, uh, if you recall, we talked about the, the agreement we had with STIC uh, and, um, and, and uh, the school system. Um, we were waiting for, uh, from the first meeting, we, were, we needed to have some processes and some paperwork gone over and, and, and to, to finish the articulation agreement. Um, Mr. Mr. Degg, who is wonderful, he does a great job, and, and uh, ended up getting all this stuff done with the representatives from STIC. Uh, he reviewed the curricular frameworks for the classes and, and what we would do at, at Enfield High School. Um, went through the process that we do in terms of what we're naming the classes, how the kids are getting credits, and so on. He, he provided us with a great deal of information regarding the, the, the uh, whole agreement. Some courses from STIC's Mechanical Engineering Technology Associate degree will transfer to the community college system to be used to, towards either a bachelor's in mechanical engineering technology or manufacturing engineering technology. Uh, he, re, he distributed a list of eligible courses between uh, um, uh, between STIC and, and the school system. The articulate agreement between the Enfield Public Schools and STIC is a three-year agreement, and the frameworks were reviewed every three years for continual approval. I, that was I, that was curious how long it ran, and we'd asked him to get that information for us. I think all of us were pretty much um, uh, very satisfied with what went on. I, if you've heard you've heard us talking about it that we're trying to offer possibilities to kids. And that same conversation came out with our representatives here. We started talking about what goes on at a, at a good cost. Um, these kinds of things, if you take advantage of it, will save your family a ton of money and get you a great college education uh, at, at little expense. And it's very, very close by, so you don't have to uh, stay in a dorm. Uh, so basically, that was the, the largest part of our discussion. We postponed a couple of things because uh, there were only two members there, and we, wa we wanted to have the full discussion at the next meeting, which I believe is the, is the eight, 18th. Yeah, I think we agreed on the 18th. No, uh, we, we, no, we moved it from the 18th to the 16th. That's what it was. Uh, other than that, we did one thing on program of studies, that they're putting together an ESL courses at the high school. And um, we needed to get some descriptions in there which you're writing. They needed to get it into the program of studies, and they're giving us some draft um, um, descriptions that we may have to come back uh, if they need to be changed. But to get it on there so they could schedule the kids, we needed to uh, get it in, and we did. And the next meeting is on the uh, 16th. Yes, I checked it. It's the 16th. B Finance, Mr. Rutledge. Um, thank you. We met yesterday. Uh, Pat West continues to do an awesome job monitoring our finances. Things are looking very good for the year, and uh, um, that's about it. See policy, Mr. Rennie. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, policy committee just uh, finished up to 4,000, as we said. Uh, we have about four more thousand series to go, uh, but we're doing good. We're uh, up and about. Our next meeting is scheduled to be next Wednesday, uh, but we will have some conversations in regards to that, um, possibly postponing it. So I will be in touch with uh, the team uh, to possibly postpone that till later in the month. Um, so that's about it. Next stop is uh, 5,000. D leadership, we have none. E joint facilities, we got good news that the application for the second phase of Barnard Roof is in the state's hand. So. That, that, that means you won't be doing it on Thanksgiving like we yes. did this year, right? <laughs> we got it in time to get it started in June. FJFK, we uh, they did the uh, interviews for the architect. The council approved JCJ architecture for the uh, the design, and just got a word from Randy, our, the chairman, that the contract is very close. It's still under. It's just a cleaning up in, in legal review, but it's very close to being signed. Uh, joint security, there's none, no other committees, so we'll move to... Just, a, just one comment, I'd, I'd like to agree with Mr. LeBlanc that the uh, JCJ is a wonderful group, and the presentations that we had 
uh, they did a spectacular job, and I think they're going to do a great job for, for the community. Apologize for that, Mr. Devil. Any others? So we'll move to 13, approval of regular Board of Ed meeting minutes, March 12th, 2019. Motion. Moved by Ms. LeBlanc, seconded by Mr. Poe. Any discussion? All in favor? We have five in favor Abstain. and one abstention, Mr. Rowledge. So five, zero, one. 14, approval of accounts and payroll. We don't have Mr. Ms. Riley here, so Mr. Rutledge will handle those tonight. Uh, thank you. I'll try not to mess this up. Um, the, uh, the Finance Committee met on March 25th to review financial statements for the month of February year to date and to examine various documents related to finance. Our review concluded that there is nothing significant to report to the board. Motion, I approve, we, I, I move we accept the superintendent's certification as follows. I hereby certify that in the month of February, total expenditures amount to $4,851,661.04, broken down between payroll totaling $4,006,087.57 and other accounts totaling $845,573.47. All payments have been made in accordance with the approved budget and are properly accounted for within the books of accounts. Copies of approval for check invoices are properly documented. Motion by Mr. Rutledge, Second. seconded by Ms. LeBlanc. Any discussion? Mm -hmm. Show of hands. All in favor? Against? 600. Any light item transfers? None. None. Any correspondence and communications? There are none. None. Do we have a need for executive session? So I have a motion to go into executive Who's session. Move to go into executive session for matters related to personnel and collective bargaining. Thank you, Mr. Neville. Motion by Mr. Neville, seconded by Mr. Rutledge. Any discussion? Show of hands. We are in executive session. We'll be not returning to TV, so thank you and have a nice April, um, April, yeah, April vacation. Close enough. Oh, yeah. It is April. No, that's fine. Good night, audience. Is this stuff for him? Yeah. Okay. I'm just going to. your stamina. We stayed.